Well, welcome everybody, and welcome, thanks for being here with us. Okay, here's what we got planned for today. Uh, we're going to introduce John here in just a minute, and he's going to talk about mass production uh, and logistics, and what uh, that's the foundation to how we won World War II, was our production and our logistics. So you can see up there, he's got some main uh, points he's going to talk about, and we're going to open it up to you guys to ask him questions. And uh, we think it will take, that'll take us to about noon time, then we'll kind of clear you off uh, to be, check out the rest of our uh, really nice air museum here to check displays. I'm sorry, but partly due to weather, uh, we're not going to do any flight ops. We, uh, we'd like to do that, spin some propellers out here on the ramp for you, but we're unable to do that for you today. Our displays, you know, we've got the Hellcat. We picked it today because you know, this mass production that John's going to talk about was critical in that a lot of these aircraft manufacturers, like Grumman, couldn't produce the numbers that were needed, so they farmed it out. And one of those big things that I take from this is car manufacturers started making airplanes. So Grumman was still building the Wildcat, the predecessor to this airplane when all of a sudden the Hellcat became the priority. So General Motors started building Wildcats, which allowed Grumman to produce 12,000 Hellcats in three years. So that's why we've got the Hellcat out here. Okay, so this is a really, really good match today between the, the focus of our presentation and our guest speaker. Really great match, and it's even better that he's one of us. He's a volunteer. So John is a native of Camarillo. He grew up here listening to F-89 and F-101s, blasting out of this uh, airport uh, in Afterburn on uh, alert missions. Following uh, college and a brief stint in communications, he started a 42-year career in aerospace. He started at a company called Apex uh, Aerospace, right over by the Oxnard uh, Airport, and his first assignment was production of what I know as an ISA, Integrated Servo Actuator. So a small world thing, I was able in the Air Force to fly F-16s, and at the time, back when it was uh, a young airplane, one of its most complex uh, pieces of equipment was this ISA integrated servo actuator. It took the electrical inputs from that electric jet and turned it into hydraulic power to power the flight controls. And he was involved in the production of those. Okay, after that he moved into manufacturing engineering. Is that a typo? Manufacturing engineering? Well, that's a job. That's a okay, discipline a department. Right? And, um, <laughs> and he was involved in test planning and assembly. They, that included a couple trips overseas to Japan and South Korea to train the folks on uh, how to test those, that, those pieces of equipment. He did some time at Kalamazoo, uh, Michigan, and then came back here uh, with a new trajectory in aftermarket logistics. Okay, he was involved at the beginning of the F-22 program that evolved into also the F-35 program and the Navy's F-18 program doing uh, stuff called the sparing analysis, which is critical these days in restricted budgets. you got to really plan the spare parts you have on your shelf. You can't have too many, that's too expensive. So they predict how long these parts are going to last. Okay? This evolved into some new support methodology so that they can accurately do that. He moved to north of Grumman, not too far away, in El Segundo. Um, he led the team providing spare parts uh, for Navy Hornets and also for Air Force Global Hawk, the RQ-4, unmanned airplane. And he was involved in some other programs that he just can't talk about, after which he retired in 2019. And fortunately for us, about in 2010, he started volunteering here at CAF SoCal, and he's been involved in the care and feeding of our airplanes. He also spent a tour on our staff, on staff here, uh, as the adjutant, I believe. 
He currently serves as the president of the Wings Over Camarillo organization, which plans and executes the air show we have here annually. He also is a volunteer herding the cats and all the volunteers at the massive annual air show up at Oshkosh. So he's a volunteer at heart, isn't he? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Lowe. Oh good, so now all I have to do is live up to all those words. And yes, manufacturing engineer is a real thing. You know, design engineers, project engineers invent things like let's say a flight control actuator for an airplane or a radio transmission for a car. They invent that. Well, somebody has to figure out how to make it. And that's what manufacturing engineers do is take all the engineering drawings and figure out how to make those parts, how to put them together, test them if it's required, and uh, send them on their way. So it, it is a real thing, and it's, a, it's quite an enjoyable job. So we're going to talk about production. One of the things I'll mention a few times in this is a term called GOCO, G-O hyphen C-O. And that stands for Government Owned Contractor Operator. Let the helicopter go by. Um, most of the factories in World War II were GOCOs. So the government came in uh, to a particular uh, area, built a factory, and then contracted uh, with someone like Chrysler, GM, Ford, Nash Kelvinator, uh, you know, Packard, every company you've ever heard of before, large company, and some you've probably never heard of. Uh, the government built it, and then the, the company, the contractor, operated it. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, further down here in the program, we're going to talk a little bit about Rosie the Riveter. Now we have a, a suspect Rosie standing over there to your right. Um, and I, I talk about it as a legend because it all depends on where you go looking for information to find out which lady says, I'm the Rosie that started all of this. And there's, there's a number of them that have been given credit, but truthfully, we just like to call any woman who worked in a factory in those years a Rosie, and we, we call them that as a term of endearment uh, because of what they did for the war effort, whether they were actually doing riveting, welding, um, doing wiring, painting, stamping out parts, any job you can think of to make munitions and equipment, they did. So. We like to, to all hold them close to our heart. We'll talk about Merlins, and not Merlin the magician, but Merlin V12s that Rolls-Royce developed, and then we made 54,000 of them here in the States. Um, a little bit about tanks, guns, and bullets, and, uh, and how we made ships, just like cars on an assembly line, and then a few of the, the lesser known supporting players that you may not have been aware of. And now let me preface this with, with saying that uh, when you start looking for this various information of who did what, who made what, there are so many that um, each individual company we could spend a couple of hours talking about. So um, in the interest of your valuable time, I've picked some of those that, that have uh, a particular meaning, and uh, some of you may have seen it, heard about them, read about them, uh, maybe not, but uh, we'll get into that. So, here we go. So, we're going to talk about the arsenal of democracy. Now, many of you know that FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, talked about that in a speech. He actually didn't invent the term, but he did use it. 
but we're going to start off talking about 1938 to 1940 before the event that put the United States into World War II. Meanwhile, in Europe, as you well know, Hitler was rampaging around, conquering various countries and pieces of real estate. Um, here at the, in the United States, even though we were supposed to be neutral and there were strong feelings about not getting involved in this conflict, yet FDR had the foresight to make sure that we were preparing. So, here's a piece of equipment. Now, anybody that's been in a machine shop will recognize this as a lathe. And I would say it's one of the most important instruments of war because you use it to make parts for cars, for tanks, for airplanes, for music, uh, munitions. I don't know about you, but I don't know that I'd like to have a piece of high explosive chucked up in that lathe and be shaping it uh, into a point to go, uh, go into a big cartridge case, but yet we had women and men doing that, actually taking a piece of extruded explosive and then shaping it on the lathe. Well, anyhow, in 1938, as we're speaking about, the government started the Educational Orders Act. And now, while that might sound academic, what it was really doing was giving out small, basically, study contracts to various companies to see if they could make something. And if they could make it, would they be able to go into mass production if that was called for? So there were a number of those let out. They, they went out to Chrysler, to Ford, to GM, to all the, all the various large companies. Um, in 1939, they, uh, they gave contracts to Winchester Repeating Arms to see if they could make rifles for the Army, um, recoil mechanisms, and just, just a number of different companies uh, were given these contracts. Now, one of the companies that did uh, successfully work one contract and was given a couple of others that they ultimately didn't fulfill was Chrysler, and we'll be talking about Chrysler in a few minutes. But here's the important thing. If you can read that, the top label says, this machine conforms to orders of the War Production Board. So that was on that lathe and meant it met the requirements of the War Production Board and was therefore government owned and would be used to help win the war. And the bottom there shows property of Defense Plant Corporation, which was the government entity that built so many of the uh, different plants that were used during the war. Some, and by the way, some of those plants are still in existence today. Other ones have, have pretty much disappeared because their particular need was gone. So, May, May 1940, there's FDR standing in front of all those microphones, giving an address to Congress. Uh, and he said, our immediate problem is to superimpose on our production capacity a greatly increased additional production ca uh, capability. And this is when he said, I would like to see this nation geared up to turn out at least 50,000 planes a year. And now think about it. We had never done 50,000 of anything prior to that but he wanted a nation to provide 50,000 military and naval airplanes. And it's interesting, he, he put the army under military and then said, and naval planes. But nevertheless, that was his big call to action. Well, some of you might recognize this gentleman, Reichsmarschall Hermann Goring. Uh, he said at the time, no one can build 50,000 planes a year. That's pure propaganda. Well, guess what? That was, that was not a very prophetic thing to say. So here's FDR. Uh, after 
the presidential campaign in 1940, he took off on a little boat ride on the cruiser USS Tuscaloosa and went over across the Atlantic into the Caribbean, nice little cruise to, to relax. But this is when, A, he came up with the idea of Lend-Lease as a way to transfer munitions to our main ally, Great Britain. But this is when he also said, we must be the great arsenal of democracy. And it was when he returned on that trip that he presented that again to America. But when he said we need to be the arsenal of democracy, we were still making airplanes by hand. This nice lady there that would later probably become a Rosie is ironing cloth for cloth-covered airplanes. You can't do that in mass production. But yet, here we are, guys climbing around a single airplane, doing things to it. That's not mass production. Here's a single airplane under construction. Now, if you don't recognize that, that was the Douglas B-19 that was a contract to make an intercontinental bomber, but unfortunately, engine technology was not up to the task at that period in time. So they built that one down in Long Beach, flew it around some, big, huge airplane, uh, but that was the only one. Now this is Douglas building B-18 Bolo bombers. Again, does that look like an assembly line to you? No, it's all in the shop and they're putting them together, different guys climbing on them, putting different parts on. I don't know if any of you recognize this. This is Consolidated Aircraft in San Diego building Liberators in 1940 out in the backyard. And if you look out in the distance, there's the ocean. They're right on the beach, nearly. So you've got airplanes that are out in the sun, and the sun heats them up, and the metal expands, it contracts. When Charles Sorensen, who worked for Henry Ford, visited there as a prelude to Ford taking on the, the contract to build B-24s, when he looked at that, he said, how in the world do you put parts on those airplanes when they're out in the sun, growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking all day long? He just couldn't believe that, because you didn't make cars out in the backyard, you made cars on an assembly line. So here's the inside of Consolidated Shop at the time, making lots of Liberator parts, but again, not an assembly line because here they are out in the backyard working on an early model B-24. Um, and again, Charlie Sorensen just couldn't believe how they were putting these airplanes together outside. Although most of the California airplane companies did use the ability with our weather here to do a lot of work on the airplanes outside. You will see that with North American. You will see that with Lockheed Burbank building P-38s. You know, once the airplane was all together in one piece, then they shoved it outside and did all of the finish work outdoors. So here's Honolulu in 1941 awash in sailors. Hey, that was good duty to be in Hawaii in 1941. You know, great weather, lots of things to do. There's a few army guys interspersed there, but it's a wonder the island wasn't sinking with all the sailors that there were there. But, but that's 1941. Life was good. Meanwhile, this is Wheeler Field, Army Air Corps base. And what do you notice there? All the airplanes ni li nicely lined up and, uh, and close together because the commanding officer was afraid of sabotage and he wanted them to be guarded and, uh, and it was easier to guard them when they were all right in one spot. Well, okay, but then what happened that day? December 7th, the world changed and uh, those airplanes on Wheeler Field, along with all the ones on Hickam, were all shot up because they were all nice and close together like that. 
But uh, you, you may remember Admiral Yamamoto, who was leading the Japanese task force, said, I'm afraid we're awakening a sleeping giant. And so there we are on December 8th, 1941, and the giant is awakening. So what did we awake to? Production. We're going to need production if we're going to win against the Axis powers. So here's the early priorities that FDR had set out of the budgeting uh, for all of under the term of munitions that we would need. So 32% of it would go to uh, aircraft, have a B-24 here as an example. 14.8% towards ships of all sizes, and there's a Liberty ship that we're going to talk about. And 25 and change percent for basically rifles, guns, cannons, and the like. And then 22%, which is a pretty good number, was for clothing, food, and everything that the GIs would need in order to carry out their mission. So now let's talk about Rosie a little bit. So you may have seen this uh, Post magazine cover. This is from May 1943, so we're a little further down the line here just to show this picture. But uh, you will notice her lunchbox says Rosie on it under her, her left elbow. She's got a big rivet gun sitting on her lap, and her foot is resting on a book that says Mein Kampf, which was Hitler's biography. So, and of course, she's eating lunch. Um, so by this time, the legend of Rosie the Riveter had actually been getting around some. This was Norman Rockwell uh, doing this Post magazine cover as he did so many magazine covers back in that time. Now, is this a Rosie? Well, any of you recognize this lady? This is Norma Jean Baker, who a few years later would become Marilyn Monroe. So yes, she was a rosy in a sense. She wasn't riveting. She's putting a propeller on the front of a drone at Radio Plane in Van Nuys. And uh, Radio Plane eventually became the unmanned division of Northrop aircraft. Uh, but at that time, it was down in, in Van Nuys, and, and uh, Norma Jean was there. Uh, doing her best. So here's a few ladies in contention. Now, left to right, we have Mary Doyle Keefe. Uh, in the center is Eleanor Otto. And then on the right is Rose Will Monroe. Now, Rose on the right was actually part of the song Rosie the Riveter that Kay Kaiser and his orchestra were singing at that time. Now, if you go to uh, the Ford Museum, which is called the Henry Ford in, uh, in Detroit, uh, Ford says that the original Rosie um, was an employee from Willow Run uh, named Rose Will Monroe. Well, okay, but what about the, the gal on the left? Now, there's also, um, the lady, now, the lady in the center is Eleanor Otto. Now, she began her career as a Rosie the Riveter at Roar Corporation down in San Diego County, who was building assemblies for Consolidated. And then many, many years later, she finished out her career at Boeing Long Beach working on C-17s, even though C-17 wasn't riveted, but nonetheless, she worked there before she finally uh, gave up working on airplanes. But a nice lady, she's actually visited uh, our CAF here in Camarillo. But the Rosie, the Rosie behind the song, Rosie the Riveter, was Rosalind P. Walter, which you might see in your brochures. Now, she was a Riveter on Corsairs. Uh, but the one in the magazine is supposed to be Mary Doyle Keefe, who 
unfortunately passed away in 2015. But there's another one. This is Naomi Parker Fraley. She's working on a machine there at NAS Alameda. She's a California gal, woman, and uh, she did that for a while and then went on to other things. But there's a school of thought when you look at the bandana she has on her head that she was the actual model used for this poster. And now, uh, if you're not aware, this poster was done by an artist uh, named J. Howard Miller, and he did it for Westinghouse. And it was not supposed to be a public poster. It was just supposed to be internal in the Westinghouse factories to encourage the women to be there all the time, to cut down on sickness and, and absence for other reasons. Uh, after this, it kind of just went into the archives for many years until, you know, a short time ago it was rediscovered. And now we have the National Association of, of Rosies uh, that get together every year different places in the country. So many women have been attributed both to this poster as well as Norman Rockwell's, but as I said earlier, they're all Rosies, they're, they're all important. So here's a Rosie right here. She's riveting on the, on the front of a cockpit for DC-3 C-47 down in Long Beach. This is Ford Willow Run that we're gonna talk more about in a few minutes. These ladies are working on a wing section and now while you see the eight of them in front, you have to remember there's an equal number on the other side holding the bucking bars because these ladies all have the rivet guns on the other side. They're holding the bar uh, to beat again. So it took a lot of women to, to make those wings. Here's a couple of Rosies working on a Douglas airplane in Long Beach. And now you'll notice in several of these photos that I'm showing, these women knew the picture was going to be taken because their clothes are nice and clean, their hairs, even though they may be wearing a bandana for proper safety, um, their hair is still done and uh, they don't really look like they've just done a 12-hour day pounding rivets. This is a lady working on a Vault aircraft in Tennessee. The wing is actually flipped up sideways before being assembled to the airplane uh, to make it easier to do the work like she's doing. This is another lady uh, down at Valti in Tennessee uh, drilling holes, a, a rosy nonetheless. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, if you've looked at, uh, at various pictures online from airplane factories, once in a while, you'll see a picture like this. They had ladies on skates, usually young, 18, 19, 20 or so, on skates to go about the factory to deliver shop orders, blueprints, um, inner office mail, or whatever. Uh, this is actually a picture taken uh, by the Office of War Information, OWI, at Douglas El Segundo which was building dauntless dive bombers for the Navy. And it's now Northrop Grumman building half of F-18s for the U.S. Navy. This lady is uh, doing wiring on a sub-assembly for uh, B-25s at North American Inglewood. And this lady is really into her work, leaning through the engine mount for uh, B-25s, again, in Inglewood. And uh, I guess we'd call her Rosie the Sparky or something, because she's doing electrical wiring for instrument panel. Uh, but again, notice how nice she looks. She knew the picture was going to be taken that day, so she came to work with her blouse nice and ironed, uh, her hair done and everything. Here's three ladies working on a uh, R1830 engine on a C-47 at Douglas Long Beach. 
again, the California sun. So here we have Northrop, I'm sorry, North American in uh, Inglewood, a couple of ladies masking off a B-25 that's going to get sprayed uh, with olive drab paint, although later on the Air Corps realized that all that olive drab paint wasn't needed and they then just started flying all the planes uh, bare aluminum. Here's a couple of ladies at Goodyear in Ohio working on a fuel cell. And uh, you, you can't tell from the picture, but that was dirty, smelly work using all the, all the compounds to glue the fittings because the cell itself, and we have a cell um, over on display so you can see one up close. The cells were molded, but then all of the various fittings and such uh, had to be glued into place. And I'll tell you what, they're still being made the same way. You go down to uh, the fuel cell factory in Georgia, and guess what? Same way, still molding the cells, but then uh, assembly line workers like these ladies have to glue all of the fittings in. Here's a whole room full of Rosies working on uh, dinghies for survival, both for single engine aircraft for the Navy and uh, and the larger multi-engines that had bigger crews in them. You may have seen this uh, picture along the way of uh, three wasps. Uh, this is in Laredo, Texas at a base there, and they're walking in front of Martin Marauders, B-26s, which the guys had a hard time flying. But here you got ladies taking the task to test fly those things and also to deliver them to uh, the East Coast to get flown over to Europe. You may, may not have ever read this, but early on in the B-29 program, uh, guys were scared to fly B-29s. They were a handful. There was a lot of early problems with the engines catching on fire. Uh, so Paul Tibbetts, who was the pilot of the Enola Gay that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, um, found some lady wasps, trained them how to fly the B-29, and then had them fly to every base in the country to show the guys that, well, if women can fly this plane, then men can fly this plane, and shame them, basically, into flying them. Here's some more wasps. Obviously, got to be Sweetwater, Texas training base, because all you can see to the horizon are AT6s, but nonetheless, they were good instructors. Now, here's some Rosies, but they're not doing riveting. They're wiping down a railroad engine. A lot of women picked up the slack on the railroads to keep them running, because, of course, uh, at that period of time, so many uh, trains were running carrying both cargo and soldiers across the country. Uh, so it took, it took women to keep, uh, keep the railroads going. Their official job title, by the way, was wiper. And what are they doing? Well, they're wiping down the engine. Um, not a very dis descriptive job title, but nonetheless, uh, they took it on. Here's another lady at the railroad. She's actually operating a big turntable uh, at the repair house to turn the engines around. Um, so again, not quite as dirty as being out there wiping down the engines, but still an important job. Okay, so now let's talk about what happened beginning early uh, 1942, taking the car plants and having them build airplanes. Who had that great idea? Well, somebody did. Um, and it actually worked after a fashion. Now, if you don't recognize this right off, this is the Ford Willow Run assembly plant uh, next to Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, at the time, that was a huge, huge building. Uh, it was designed by Albert Kahn, who was a, a very well-renowned architect at the time. Um, but you, it's a little hard to see, but if you look at 
the outline of the runways, and by the way, that airport is still there. If you look at the closest runway running horizontal um, to you, you can see the factory actually makes a right-hand turn. And that was because that was the border between Washtenaw County and Wayne County. And Henry Ford built this factory on his own dime. So rather than it being a go-co, when it was built, it was really a COCO, contractor owned, contractor operated, although after it was completed, he leased it back to uh, the government for the duration of the war. But Henry didn't want to pay higher taxes in the neighboring county, so he actually had the factory make a right-hand turn, and we have a picture showing that when it makes that right-hand turn, there was a turntable built into the floor. They moved the airplane onto the turntable, turned it sideways, and then pushed it into the extension. And then when it was complete, it came out onto the, to the ramp area. Uh, down in the lower right are housing for the employees because Ford had to hire so many people and none of them uh, were living in the area. They coming from other states or other areas in the Midwest. And so we had to build housing for him. He had to train people how to build airplanes. Uh, it, was, it was a huge undertaking to literally build an operation uh, in what had just been open uh, land there that Henry owned prior to this time. So in this picture, this is inside that building, but not the assembly line. This is building uh, center wing sections, and one of the most important things is down uh, in the lower part of the picture is this automated jig for drilling holes that the Ford engineers came up with that could drill all the holes in just a few minutes where um, Consolidated out in San Diego was doing it by hand and took them hours and hours and hours to drill all those holes. But Ford applied their automotive sense to this and used an automated uh, system for it. But meanwhile, one of the hard lessons Ford had in beginning to make airplanes was things like stamping dies to form metal. They were used to using steel for car bodies and such, and so they had steel dies. Well, you use a steel die with an aluminum part, it messes up the aluminum, scratches it, dings it, does all kinds of stuff. So they kind of had to go hat in hand back to Consolidated San Diego and say, okay, how are you guys making these parts? And well, we use soft alloys, we use rubber, we use wood, and Ford had to go that way. So they learned, a, they learned a hard lesson in the very beginning. Here's some Rosies um, working on a fuselage section of the B-24. If you know anything about airplane construction, this is quite a bit different from uh, most of the aircraft we're used to that have ribs and stringers and then the skin riveted on the outside. You see it's very much uh, a lattice work, but that was, that was part of the design uh, of this airplane. So here's looking back uh, from about midpoint in the assembly line uh, where the components start coming together. Now, many of you have probably heard that towards the end, Ford was kicking out an airplane every 63 minutes. That had been a goal uh, from the beginning. It took them uh, until 1945 to get there, but they did. And now that was doing final assembly. You know, you couldn't build the entire airplane, uh, manufacture the airplane on the assembly line. You were assembling major components like a complete wing uh, with all four engines attached to uh, a fuselage sub-assembly and such. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is like all wartime factories, there's no windows. All the windows were enclosed because 
um, even though this was in Michigan, there was still the, the fear of the enemy uh, coming over at night and bombing the place. So no windows, all lights, and you can see uh, how many fluorescent lights there are there. Now, this is further down the line. This is December 1942, and uh, they're starting to make stride building complete bombers because early on, the Liberator production pool said that Ford would just make knockdown kits, which is like all the sub-assemblies and parts necessary to build the bomber, but not actually build complete bombers. And later on in 1942, they said, we want to do complete bombers. And finally in October, they were told they could do that. Um, so now they're starting to come down the line. And this picture is called At the Turn. If you look uh, on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see uh, the tail of an aircraft that's already been turned. And down in front is the wing sticking out that's a plane that's on the turntable. So when they get to this point, then they get turned and start going 90 degrees to the, to the rest of the assembly line. Is that the most efficient flow for an assembly line? Absolutely not, but Henry didn't want to pay more taxes, so that's the way they made it. So when they came out, here's an early model B-24 built at Willow Run sitting out on the ramp with uh, Michigan is not quite billiard table, but it also doesn't have uh, mountains in the, in the um, southern part of the state, so just little hills over there in the background. And then finally, it's 1944, and Ford's finally hit their stride. There's aircraft number 6,000, and you can see them stacked up on the ramp there. When they got to that point, they actually had Army pilots, co-pilots, navigators sleeping on cots in the building uh, waiting to take an airplane and fly it out. They had you know, almost 100, if not 200 of these pilots and navigators camped out there just waiting to take a plane because they were coming out uh, so fast like that. But not too long after this, they, they completed construction and the Air Force wanted B-29s now instead of B-24s. Um, so Willow Run started making parts for B-29s. This is Fort Worth, Texas, Air Force plant number four, which today is Lockheed, uh, but this is early, early on uh, when it was built. The interesting thing is, if you know your history, you know that plant four in Fort Worth and building 3001 in Oklahoma City were built with the same plans by the same contractor in 1942. They are identical buildings, at least on the outside, although the insides have, have had, uh, you know, renovation done to them over the years. But this is early on because you only see airplanes coming down the one side of the line. And this looks to you like a B-24 coming together, but it's not. It's a C-87, which was the cargo version of the B-24. So, Instead of having bomb bays in it, it was all enclosed, had doors uh, on the left side that you can see open there, and also had a solid nose that would swivel open so you could move cargo or people uh, in and out of those. those. Those were used extensively over in the Pacific Theater uh, later on, but that's a C-87. So now here we are in Fort Worth, in mass production, you see there's two lines coming down. Now you notice Ford ran all the airplanes in a straight line, uh, co consolidated here in Fort Worth, ran them at an angle like that. What you can't see is there's actually rails in the floor, and so the airplanes move every so many hours to the next uh, position. Uh, and then when they get to the end of the line, they're a complete plane, of course, to to move out onto the ramp. But you can see just how many aircraft they have in work 
uh, on both sides of that factory floor. Here's a couple of them getting ready to go out and see the sun for the first time. And then they end up out here on the ramp. Now this is at Fort Worth. Uh, the building on the left is Plant 4, which today is Lockheed. Uh, the buildings off in the distance are what was at the time was Carswell Air Force Base. It's now uh, Joint uh, Air Base, Navy, and uh, Air Force. Uh, if you watch Strategic Air Command on YouTube or anywhere else with Jimmy Stewart with the B-36s, they're flying off of that runway there at Carswell. You also get to see them coming into land over Lake Worth. Um, the same picture you get to see now when you, when you fly in there. But um, B-24s at this time and then after that, B-32 Dominators, which was the backup airplane for uh, B-29s, just in case they had too many problems with B-29s. After that, B-36, the aluminum overcast plane, those were in that building, but only one line of them when you look at the, the size of a B-36. After that, they built B-58 Hustlers there. After that, F-111s uh, that did El Dorado Canyon and served, uh, served a great deal with, with our Air Force during the Vietnam time. And then after that, um, Rob's favorite airplane, the F-16s, were built there for many years. They're now continuing production over in Georgia because in this factory here, F-35s are being built. So this one building has had uh, a long life, but it is still government-owned, contractor-operated. So let's talk about Merlins a little bit here. Here's the Packard Car Company executives, and they're saying they're, it's all out on engines. Well, you have to understand that Rolls-Royce needed help building Merlins. Well, in their mind, what company would have been the best? Well, they thought Ford, because after all, everybody knows Henry Ford invented the moving assembly line. Not assembly line, but moving assembly line. So they came to Ford, made their presentation, and Henry said, okay, we'll do it. Two days later, Henry said, we're not going to do it. So the Rolls-Royce people had to figure out then what to do. Well, in America at the time, Packard was kind of considered the Rolls-Royce of American cars. So they went to Packard. Packard management said, we'll do it. So here's the last Packard coming off the line uh, at the beginning of the war until after the war uh, when, when car production could continue. So this is what a Merlin looks like all by itself. It's 1,650 cubic inches, V12, uh, typical kind of aircraft, V engine. If you look the right and lower right of the picture, that's where the magic of a Merlin is. It's a two-stage, two-speed supercharger that allowed Mustangs, Spitfires, Lancasters, everything that had a Merlin in it to fly high. Um, so it was a great invention that they had there and made all the difference in our Mustangs being able to fly from England all the way to Berlin and back uh, because of the mileage it had and the fact that they could fly um, up at 40,000 feet with them. Here's a view from the other side of the engine. Now you'll notice how the exhaust pipes uh, cant towards the back. We actually figured out that by doing that, by aiming like that, we got a little more speed out of the airplane. They were acting like, like jet boosters. So you'll always see that uh, on, uh, on Mustangs and Spitfires being aimed like that. The biggest thing that happened when Packard was going to do uh, the production of these 
was they, of course, had to get all of the engineering drawings from Rolls-Royce because the deal was these were going to be absolutely identical engines interchangeable with Rolls-Royce engines. Well, at the time, uh, the English standard for fasteners was not SAE inch like we use or, or even what we recognize today as, uh, as metric. It was much different. Um, and uh, so they had, to, they had to continue using the same size uh, fasteners and it was such a deal um, with these Whitworth style fasteners that Packard undertook making all of the bolts, screws, nuts, all of the fastener stuff they needed, they did that in-house to control it because sending it out to an outside uh, job shop to make them uh, wouldn't have come out very well. Now the other thing is that all of the uh, ancillary items, carburetors and magnetos and all that kind of stuff, they did um, send out to outside shops to be made, uh, but they were made to the Rolls-Royce drawing. So they were still Whitworth fasteners and they could be bolted on a Packard engine or a Rolls-Royce engine uh, and, uh, and still work. So that was very important that they were absolutely interchangeable. So this is a shot over at Rolls-Royce in England uh, where they're trying to get started uh, with mass production. Got some ladies uh, assembling heads there. But meanwhile, at Packard, as far as you can see, there's crankshafts being machined for Merlins, because that's all they were making was, was Merlins. So quite a big deal. And here they are assembling engines. Again, they're on carts, and you can see tracks in the floor so they can push them around, uh, but looks a little bit different than the previous shot uh, from Rolls-Royce. And then, of course, this is an engine test cell, and with all of the plumbing and other claptrap that you need to test this engine in the cell, you can hardly see the engine, but that's a lot of work uh, just a test run an engine, and yet uh, they did that 54,000 times. So here's kind of a family portrait of uh, everything flying with Merlin engines. You know, all of them other than the Mustang were, of course, uh, British Craft, Mosquito, Wellingtons, Lancasters, they all used Merlins. Uh, once in a while, if you're at the big air show in Oshkosh, you get a treat and actually get to see a Mustang and a Spitfire and a Mosquito and a Lancaster come by. So you hear one Merlin, you hear two Merlins, and then you hear four Merlins because they have a very unique sound. You can always tell a Merlin airplane when it's flying overhead. And then, of course, the two most famous and well thought of fighters, Spit and Mustang, both of them running Merlins. The Spit probably has a Rolls Royce, although it could have a Packard engine in it, but it doesn't matter because they were interchangeable and worked just the same. So now let's talk about your father's Buick, or the Buick that wasn't your father's. You remember that line, not your father's Buick? Well, like the other car companies, Buick um, was tasked with building aircraft engines. So the one that they really worked the most on was the um, R, Pratt & Whitney R1830, 1830 cubic inch engine. They built lots of them. So here's parts being machined. Now I'll point out to you, see those guys wearing neckties there? Oh, by the way, they're not helping manufacturing anything. They're just kind of superfluous in the operation. Uh, but lots of parts being machined there. And in, in, uh, this should be Evansville, Indiana. Here's a, a beauty shot of some of the parts. You got connecting rods and some other stuff there. Here's some ladies inspecting 
cylinders that are coming in to make sure they're good to go on into the assembly area here. So here's uh, engine assembly area here at Buick and uh, more assembly here as far as you can see in this huge open bay room. Now Buick produced 71,874 1830s and then another 2,548 R2000s, which went into C-54s that Douglas was building uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They also did transmissions and such for tanks and armored vehicles. Uh, they, they did aluminum cylinder blocks for Packard. They were a, a provider to Packard, um, something like um, 52,200 cylinder blocks to Packard that they, that they cast, machined, and then shipped over to Packard in Detroit. So, uh, huge, huge amount of work. So here's what an 1830 uh, looks like with a guy standing next to it. You can get an idea of the size of the engine. So these were used in DC-3s, C-47s, um, and B-24, so lots and lots of need uh, for um, these engines. And just coincidentally, this is the nameplate on the R1830 that's the engine in our zero next door in the hangar. Now why, why in 1830? Well, because the Japanese engine for the zero um, is very scarce, you can't get parts but the 1830 just bolts right into the airplane. And it just so happens, I know it's difficult to see, um, but it's stamped right there, manufactured by Buick. So we actually have a Buick engine from um, Evansville, Indiana in our zero here in Camarillo. So tanks, guns, bullets, Need a lot of them, right? You're going to fight a war, you need lots of tanks, guns, and bullets. So I always love these ads from that time period. So here's a Chrysler ad on how to drive and operate a Sherman tank, like the average person sitting at home reading their Life magazine is going to run out and operate a Sherman tank. But So this is an early shot from the Chrysler Tank Factory, again, government-owned, contractor-operated. Um, the tank in the foreground on the right is actually an M3 General Grant tank, which is what we had at the beginning of World War II. Um, a lesson that we had to relearn not so very long ago with Iraq and Afghanistan is you go to war with what you have. So we went to war with Grant tanks, M3 tanks, and up against Panzers and everything else. They weren't that great. So we started then making M4 Shermans, which are the tanks in the center and the left. Uh, what's interesting about this photo is there's a sign on the right-hand tank, over the right-hand corner, um, that says, M M4 tanks are crowding this last M3. So the one on the right is the last M3 being produced, and then the other two are the first of the M4 Shermans coming off the line. Chrysler did uh, M4A4s, they did M4105s, um, they did 18,000 Sherman tanks. This is later on. Um, so now all you see are M4s coming down the line. Now M4s were, were built there by Chrysler. GM built some. They were built at what had been the locomotive factory in Lima, Ohio, as opposed to Lima, Peru. It's Lima, Ohio. Um, Pacific Car and Foundry in Washington State that you might recognize today as PACAR that builds Peterbilt and Kenworth trucks, well, they built Sherman tanks. A big heavy truck factory you'd think would be an easy fit to do Sherman, so they did. 
Now, anybody in the room ever seen this engine before? This, <laughs> this is a Chrysler multi-bank engine, which they developed and produced very quickly because there was a shortage of the normal engines for M4 tanks. This is actually five straight six engines bolted together on a common crankcase. If you look in the front, you can see five distinct distributors, all of them feeding a six-cylinder engine. It was 1,500 total cubic inches, 450 horsepower, and they made, <laughs> they made 7,400, I'm sorry, they made 9,965 of these because they needed spares. There was 7,499 uh, M4s and derivatives that came out of the factory with this crazy looking engine. But uh, exigency of wartime, they developed it quick. It worked, it was 450 horsepower, more than enough to drive a Sherman tank. So, you ready to boss your Bofor twin 40 millimeter cannons? Um, well, Chrysler made those too. So here's a picture of a quad mount of two double Bofors, 40 millimeters. If you were on any kind of ship in the South Pacific in early 1945, you really wanted these guns because they were the best way to stop kamikazes coming at your ship. So here's Chrysler shop um, working breech blocks. Now, this again w was possible because they had gotten the study contract early on. Um, and the Army had actually had them estimate making 37 millimeter guns and 75 millimeter guns, but then push comes to shove and they had them making these Bofors 40 millimeters. Here's boring and drilling of the long barrels. Those are done with what's called gun drills, which are very long drill bits that will run straight and through to both drill a gun barrel as well as rifle it. And we still use those machines today. The technology has gotten a little fancier with electronic controls, but the gun drilling procedure itself uh, is still the same. Here's spare barrels being crated up um, because by the end of the, the, end of the time, uh, they did 28,892 guns. Not just barrels, but guns. It started out, they were supposed to do 300 guns a month, and then it went to 1,500 guns a month, and then 1,600 guns a month. So they produced a lot of them. So here's a shipboard installation of a twin Bofors. Now early on, those were manually aimed by the sailors, but then later they hooked them to remote gun directors and had synchronizing motors uh, on the guns to aim them. And the, same, the sailors were just feeding the ammunition to them as fast as these things were firing. Okay, gun lovers out here, you recognize these two different shells? On the left is a 30 caliber M1 carbine round, a little bit different from M1 Garand. These were for carbines. And then the one on the right is a 45 ACP, 45 um, automatic Colt pistol, otherwise known to most of us as a 1911 uh, semi-automatic pistol. Well, early on, the government figured they needed a whole lot of these. The one on the left, the 30 cal, Chrysler managed 485,000, I'm sorry, 485 million, 463,000 of those. The 45 ACPs on the right, stay with me here, they produce 3,264,281,914 of them, okay? 
So here's, uh, here's ladies working on machining uh, the cartridges, and of course two guys in neckties on the right that are just looking at a clipboard, not doing anything. Um, in December of 41, the president of Chrysler, J, or K.T. Keller, was meeting with uh, government procurement, and this lieutenant colonel said, can you make uh, 45 caliber cartridges? And he said, sure. Um, you know, we did it before with the educational orders. And the colonel said, do you always say yes so quickly to something like this? And Keller said, well, not always, Colonel, but we've been hearing more and more lately about billions of things, and I can't imagine what that looks like, so I want to make a billion of something so I can see what it looks like. Well, they did. They made three billion. The original order was for five million. And then a couple of days later, a change order came in. We want seven million, 500,000. And then 24 hours later, we want 10 million a day of these. And then finally, 12,500,000 of them a day. That's how you get to 3 billion. So there you go. There's what a billion 45 ACP rounds look like when they're all crated up. And uh, I guess this guy's the government inspector and he has to count every one of them. This is the back end of the nose of a B-29. This is the Chrysler DeSoto Warren plant. They're doing this nose section, putting it all together, putting all the wiring in. The trick is that there's four miles of wiring out of the eight miles of wiring in the airplane. Four miles of it are in the nose. And oh, by the way, Chrysler also made 18,000 of these, the R3350s that went in the B-29s, 18,000 of those. Okay, ships like cars. Can we build ships like cars? Do it fast? Well, that's what Henry J. Kaiser thought. And now remember, what was Henry Kaiser's resume at this point in 1941? Well, he had built... Hoover Dam, Bonneville Dam, Grand Coulee Dam, and the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. So, yeah, he knew all about building boats, ships, sure. But he took it on and they, they listened to him. So here you go, here's one of the ship, shipyards. Now remember, these were Richmond, California, and up in Oregon, and then several on the, on the East Coast. The 18 shipyards that ran through this program building Liberty ships cranked out 2,751 Liberty ships. That's the biggest class of ships ever produced in history. This picture just gives you an idea of the size of the keel and the propeller and the rudder on Liberty ship. These guys that are down there in the bottom of the picture are actually putting grease on the ways because that ship's about to be launched. And so it's going to get shoved out um, right where those guys are in a few minutes. How's this for a commute to work? Uh, you show up at work and then you still got to climb a ladder to get up on the ship uh, to do welding and pipe fitting and all of that kind of work. Here's the ship in the way get, getting near completion. Now, originally, the industry average for building a ship like this was 230 days. Kaiser initially started it with 45 days. And in November 1942, one yard crew built the Liberty ship, Robert E. Perry, in four days and 15 and a half hours. How did they do that? Well, because it's all modules and sections that would come together. But look at this. Here's these cranes, and you'll notice they're on tracks, and in the background are subassemblies, modules, and other big pieces that have to get craned into the ways 
to make the to make the ships. I don't know about you, but I don't know what that was like being that high up, moving that thing along the railroad tracks. But and oh, by the way, here's Rosie the welder. These ships were welded together, not riveted, which is why they were able to build them so quickly. Yes, there was a few early on that actually broke apart on weld seams, but uh, they learned from that and got past that problem. But here's a picture of all the various components that would come together uh, to build the ship. So this was, this was an automobile type idea to build the ship, bringing in all of these sub-assemblies, welding them together, and you've got a ship. At first I thought this was everybody waiting in the lunch line, uh, but it's really everybody getting ready because they're gonna launch another ship and everybody wants to cheer as it goes down the ways and into the water. So here's the SS William Clark from Kaiser, Oregon, being launched, going down the ways, and of course they did the normal hit the champagne bottle on the prow of it and all that kind of stuff. But you see up overhead, there's a big chunk of steel there on a crane. That ship is not even completely off of the way, and they're already bringing in the steel to start the keel for the next ship. That's how fast they were doing this. No brakes, no brakes for the weary. As soon as that was out of the way, in comes the steel. And then here's a complete Liberty ship sitting at the dock, ready to handle cargo. So unbelievable amount of work to build a ship as fast as they were doing it. Uh, but wartime expedient, um, by the way, they did all of maybe 11 knots on a good day. So they were a big target uh, for the enemy because they were so slow, but it was, it was a necessary um, wartime thing to do. Okay, just a couple of the supporting players that you might not have been aware of. Everybody knows about Lionel model trains, right? HO trains, N size trains. Lionel's been around for a long time. Lionel made ship's compasses, otherwise known as binnacles, um, because they were used to working with soft metal, with brass, with copper. Um, so the name tag, the, the inspection tag on there actually says made by Lionel, and it's around the periphery of it. Here's another ship's compass made by Lionel, so they were a producer of those, not all that far out of their wheelhouse to make those. Anybody recognize this? You ever hear of Cushman scooters? Sure, those of us with a little white hair uh, know what a Cushman scooter is. The Post office, I remember in the 1950s, our postman drove a Cushman scooter delivering the, the mail to us. Well, this is a Cushman scooter intended to be parachuted into Normandy. You'll see the parachute attached to it on the back. It's got the straps on it, ready to be thrown out of a C-47 and parachuted down to our guys on the ground um, after D-Day. So. I had never seen these before undertaken this, this effort, but they made a lot of those um, just to help guys get around, officers, messengers, or whatever. Um, if you look online, you can see pictures in Normandy of GIs on these Cushman scooters. This is a picture um, out of a museum of a mine detector, um, and this was made by Detrola Radio. Now, again, for some of you with, with uh, hair like mine, Detroler did a lot of work making private label brand radios like True Tone for Western Auto, remember Western Auto? And then Silver Tone radios for Sears Roebuck, remember Sears Roebuck? Um, that was their business before the war, once the war started because they knew how to do electronic stuff uh, they started making mine detectors. Okay, field radio and a walkie-talkie. 
Who made those? Everybody know? Ah, close but no cigar. They were made by Galvin Manufacturing, which about five years later became Motorola. The company changed their name to Motorola. But the handy talky walkie talkie there on the right, doesn't that look like the first mobile phones that came out? <laughs> it's amazing how history repeats itself. Okay, Higgins boats, landing craft, Normandy invasion, all the, all the island invasions in the Pacific. Andrew Jackson Higgins built all those down in, uh, in Louisiana. Oh, by the way, he did not accept any profit from making all of these. He felt as a patriot he shouldn't be making profit. These, these boats right here are LCVPs, landing craft, comma, vehicle, comma, personnel. So you could put a Jeep in them, um, you could put guys in them to hit the beach. They made 12,500 of those boats. And something that I didn't know um, before a short time ago was Higgins also undertook building two C-46s under license from Curtis. Now we have a C-46 parked out here on the ramp. You can look at the size of that airplane. Talk about something that wasn't in the wheelhouse of Higgins, if you'll excuse the pun. They took, took upon an order to build C-46s, but by the summer of 1945, they had only completed the second one, so the Army canceled the order at that time. But who knew that a wooden boat company would try to make an aluminum airplane? On the trailer in this picture is a quad 50 caliber um, setup. Um, Guess who was putting those together for the Army? A paper company known by the name of Kimberly Clark. We usually think of them for like Kleenex tissues or something. Nope, they put those together. The key thing in this photo is you can see four torpedo tubes in the forward compartment of this submarine. They're all nice gold round things there. Any idea who made those torpedo tubes for us? <laughs> uh, Kohler. Kohler Manufacturing of Kohler, Wisconsin that we tend to think of as making sinks and toilets and other household things like that. Well, they knew how to cast things. These, these torpedo tubes were cast, um, so it was easy for them to take on that work. All right, this is an M1 anti-aircraft gun, 120 millimeter, built by GM at their Fisher Body Plant in Grand Rapids, Michigan. What do 105 millimeter cannons do when you fire them? They kick back. So you need an anti-recoil mechanism to absorb that force. Well, hey, wouldn't elevator companies know how to absorb force when an elevator hits the ground floor? So the, the recoil mechanisms on these were made by Otis Elevator as a subcontractor to GM who was making the cannon. Okay, this is the flight engineer console in a B-29. B-29 was the first plane we had with the actual uh, flight engineer's console. You, you don't get to see in the picture the upper one with all the dials and gauges but it was always said that the flight engineer was running the airplane and the pilot was just steering it. Well, as complicated as that is, which it is complicated, those were built by Shakespeare in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Shakespeare, some of you might know the name, that they made fishing rods, they made citizens band antennas, things like that. But at this time uh, in the war, they were making these along with other things, but interesting idea, you take somebody making fishing poles and have them make something as complicated as this. This isn't a great picture and it's the only one I could find. This is the Gulf Ordnance Plant to make ordnance in Mississippi. It's 6,000 acres, um, had had 
a 4,000 seat cafeteria, its own telephone exchange, 450 homes for employees, five dormitories, seven water wells, a half million gallon water tank, a hospital, 52 concrete bomb storage igloos that were camouflaged, 26 magazines, production lines, machine shops, a pistol range, its own sewage disposal plant, and 25 raw material warehouses. It also had 27 miles of private railroad track. This was next to Prairie, Mississippi. It was just farmland that the government came in and uh, declared eminent domain and built this place. Here's some ladies um, pressing explosive into cartridges. And of course, we got the guy with a necktie and a clipboard there not doing anything to help the war effort. But you can see it's, it's hard to tell, but the ladies are actually wearing like smocks because they're, they're dealing with um, explosive powder. So you want to keep it off of their clothes. And then this lady is pressing nose cones onto, onto cartridges. Now this plant was in operation from 1942 when it was built until the end of the war. Um, they produced five different sizes of, of shells. They did rocket launchers, 100 pound bombs, tracer ammunition. Um, they estimated that this single plant supplied 25% of the munitions we needed during World War II. Um, sprung up out of nowhere and now there's only just a couple of bare remnants of buildings left there. Most of it's gone. It's back to being a prairie. Okay. Singer Showing Machine Company. Sewing Machine Company makes a lot of little small parts to go into sewing machines, right? So you'd think they could make something like a 1911 pistol. Well, the government gave them an order early on with one of the educational orders. We want you to make 500 pistols and we want you to be able to make 100 a day. Well, Singer made all 500, but it took them like a month. So the government said, okay, thank you very much for that. And they sent the work off to the, the regular firearms manufacturers and Singer ended up not making pistols during the war. All right, so Rob kind of mentioned this early on. What many of us probably didn't realize was the strategy that FDR had back at the beginning of this. We used a logistic strategy while Hitler and his friends were using a blitzkrieg strategy. Blitzkrieg was lightning war, hit them hard, hit them fast. But we built armaments in depth when you're talking about 299,000 airplanes that we built. Um, when you're talking about the numbers of Sherman tanks, the numbers of trucks that Dodge and GM and Studebaker built, all of that thousands upon thousands of those things that were that were needed. So the whole thing was Hitler had thought he was going to win everything quickly, so he didn't invest in infrastructure. He didn't invest in building GOKOs or any other kind of plant. He used everything, every raw material he had just to make the weapons. So. When he found out the war was going to take longer than he thought, guess what? He had to start building some factories. We already had ours running. So, while Germany mobilized more of its men into the army than the U.S. did and spent more of its gross national product, GNP, than the United States did and actually had a higher percentage of its women working um, in industry than we had in the United States, we drowned them, absolutely drowned them in the number of munitions, of bullets, of tanks, of trucks, GIs, everything that was needed. Um, you've maybe seen the, the newsreel footage from the time. 
where our soldiers are coming along on the Autobahn in trucks and the Germans are walking the other way, walking or riding horses. Um, that gives you an idea of how we overcame them. So at the end of all of that, production absolutely was the key to victory. Okay, so Rob tells me it's time for questions. So if you have a question, Rob will be, be happy to answer it for me. Motorola. <laughs> Motorola is the answer to one question, yes. So again, if you'll be patient with me, if you have a question, please answer it, but let me get you with the microphone. This uh, frenetic activity in production. I'm yeah. wondering if there were any accidental deaths in the uh, production. If there was what? Did, did many people get killed trying to produce all this stuff? Oh, certainly, yeah. So the question is were, were people injured or killed um, in the factories? Um, yes. Um, I don't have any figures on that, but you know. Uh, you know, it certainly happened uh, because, somewhat because of the speed of production, but there also was not OSHA, or Occupational Safety and Health, uh, at that time. Um, but overall, you know, they tried to take care of their people. You know, I didn't mention when you're looking at the shipbuilding with all of those wooden <coughs> way structures that look so dangerous. Um, whatever you want to say about Henry J. Kaiser, remember he, he started Kaiser Permanente Health for his employees in the shipyards, and that company is still with us today, operation. Um, so yes, it's, it happened. You'd have to really dig into each distinct factory to get an idea of what might have happened there, but um, certainly there were, you know, hometown losses, yeah. Uh, I had heard, read in the early on, that not many in Germany were working in the factories that were ever in the But uh, what was that? They actually had a higher percentage in Germany than they had in the U.S. Do you have any idea about that? So, short answer is uh, no, I don't have any figures on that. But we also, um, you know, during that time, we, United States didn't really have information coming from Germany on how many um, they had there. But that um, quote there, Alan Gropman is a uh, retired Air Force colonel and uh, was an instructor at National Defense University and did a lot of research um, into this. And uh, um, so I'm not, I'm not disputing his findings, but I don't have direct numbers. I, I have I have direct numbers of airplanes if you want to know that. But uh, you mentioned um, the Packard name, the Merlin engine, it was identical to the Rolls Royce engine. Why the name Merlin? How did that come about? Well, Merlin was given was the Merlin name was given to the engine by Rolls Royce back in the early '30s because that. By 1940, that engine had been around for a long time and been going through growth and iterations of improvements. Um, when you look at at the Mark I Spitfire, uh, they only ha they had three bladed props because they didn't have as much power. And over time, they made improvements to the engine, went to four blade props, and uh, and more horsepower. Um, but that was the the Brits. The Brits have always been more about naming things um, than than we have. Because remember, they gave our Mustang a different name. They gave the well, the Liberator name for B-24s came from the uh, came from the Brits. Um, the uh, the Spitfire Mark 14 that we have next door in the maintenance hangar has the follow-on engine behind the Merlin. And they named it Griffin. Um, so we're now understand that even our engines, 1830s, were a cyclone, and the 2800s, twin wasp, I guess. Um, and most people call the 
the 4360s, it's the biggest piston engine we ever made. Um, 4,360 cubic inches, we called those corn cobs because of the way it looked. Um, but Pratt and Whitney and Wright, uh, the main engine guys, did give them names, but we just always call them by their size, you know, an 1830, a 2000, a 2800. So, but everybody recognizes that Mustangs and Spitfires had Merlins. You don't say, oh, it's a V1650 in that airplane. You say it's a Merlin. <laughs> it's so impressive about the huge number of airplanes that were being built all over the country. Were, was each airplane flight tested or did they just get in it and go from the ground? <laughs> well, once, once an airplane came out of the factory, then uh, there were pilots to give them a test flight, make sure they didn't come apart. Well, they I'm, took I'm asking, off, was but, every one of them tested and landed, and then the guys got out the cops and flew them wherever they wanted to go? Right, right. Many, many places that was being done by WASPs. Um, they would test fly, and the WASPs also flew them across country to the northeast, where they would, a lot of them would get disassembled, get the wings pulled off, and go on to a Liberty ship to get... Um, driven over to, uh, to Britain. Um, so, yeah, they everyone got flown and actually accepted by the Air Corps or the Navy um, before before they left the factory. That, that's my understanding. Yes, they were all uh, flown on a test flight before they were accepted by the services. If any of you have worked in in government contracting, you know, in the last 40 years or so, you know, there's always government ex uh, acceptance, and it's called a DD-250 form. That's that's the final form that the government inspector signs off to to accept whatever product it is. Now, um, a C-17 that was made recently in in uh, in Long Beach. Um, the amount of paperwork that the inspector had to sign off was about that thick. Now, back in the 40s, the equivalent DD-250 then was probably a single page, but still there had to be a government inspection stamp before the plane left for wherever it was going. Now, understand also um, that most of the planes, especially the bombers, B-17s, B-24s, B-29s, when they rolled out the back door, they did that test flight, and then they were flown to a modification center because the changes were being made so fast to the design of the airplane and to the parts, they couldn't stop the assembly line to integrate those changes. So they continued on working through the inventory that they had. The plane went to somewhere like Oklahoma City to have the changes made to them to bring it up to the the current configuration. Um, one, one notion to that is right at the beginning of Fort taking on B-24, they sent guys to San Diego to get armloads of all the engineering drawings from Consolidated, and by the time they got back to Detroit, there were already 10,000 changes on those drawings that they then had to find out about and incorporate before they ever built an airplane, so. I graduated from high school in 1940, and I immediately hitchhiked from the Elder Hands to Wichita to become a big pilot. And I came back and met the plane that I was saying, assigned to was the Hellcat and a train. I love it. I loved it that time, and I still love it. There's a great regret. <laughs> yeah, you can actually find. Oh, I forgot to turn myself on. You can actually find online some pictures of uh, of like a Hellcat that just recently got refurbished, restored, where they have a number just spray painted up on the nose, and you're looking at that like, what? What's that about? Well, they were given that number when they were pushed out on the ramp so that the test pilot guy would, okay, I gotta go fly number 19, 
and he could find that airplane. And then when they got out into a, a squadron somewhere, then they paint over that number. But there was a lot of that going on too, of just spray painting a, an ID number just for flight tests. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to point out we have a World War II veteran who just talked to us about his Hellcat experience. So welcome, thank you for being here, and thank you for what you did. So thank you very much for everybody for being here. Have a wonderful day, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next year. Thank you.